It is a pleasure to be here, Greg, and thanks to um, Mass Inc. and all of you, uh, everyone in this room. We have so many uh, luminaries here that I, I won't list you all, but um, we are. I am delighted to be here with you and grateful for this huge crowd on a rainy Monday morning um, to talk about this incredible topic. And uh, what a topic it is. Um, I had lunch almost a few years ago now, I think, with Greg Torres and Al Kanab, uh, and we talked about what we could do in Washington to support um, the work of criminal justice reform, the work of rebuilding communities, of giving people a chance and, and hope despite a criminal record and how we use our reforms to build a strong economy for all. But we've, we've run into a major problem in Washington and, uh, and a major setback, to say the least. Um, because criminal justice reform is at the center of our social and economic future. And I was very lucky early in my career as an attorney to work for a judge on the federal bench in Colorado named Alfred Araj. And he was senior status when I clerked for him, so he had a little more flexibility. And I noticed that we didn't have any criminal docket. And I asked him why, and he said it was because of the sentencing guidelines. He said, I'm a judge, not a calculator. And I am supposed to assess the situation before me. And this was a pretty law and order guy. It wasn't like people were getting off easy. But he wanted that ability to assess the totality of the defendants and their situations before him. So he refused to take um, criminal cases once he lost that ability and that flexibility. Um, and I think that he understood and taught me that the criminal justice system, uh, looking at it honestly, requires us to really look at our institutional biases and our disparate impacts on communities of color in so many ways. Um, it cause, we need to look at the costs of incarceration and the economic impact that it has. We simply can't afford to continue to spend $80 billion with a B annually on incarcerating Americans. And as we are cutting other programs that support people, that create a safety net, that create a way to step up to opportunity, we continue our spending on incarceration and growth in that spending. We have to look realistically at the influence of the for-profit prison lobby that just got a big boost from Jeff Sessions uh, and the AG as he rolls back uh, some reforms that were made there. And we have to look at some of the great work that we've done here, but we need to continue to do, it, integrating citizens with criminal records back into society and end the revolving door that we see too often to this day uh, here in Massachusetts, even with the work that we've done. And if we want some good news, I tried to find some good news, um, uh, is that it is still true in Congress that we have bipartisan support for criminal justice reform. From Ted Cruz to Cory Booker, uh, lawmakers across the political spectrum have called for reform. And we agree that there is an economic and a moral cost to having the largest prison population in the world. And both parties see the criminal justice system is mired in outdated laws, disparate practice, and the influence of special interests. But it's going to take everyone working together to enact these meaningful reforms. And we found some opportunities. Um, my theory being uh, 
a still relatively junior member of the minority party is that we have to find those areas we can work together across the aisle, even if we disagree on almost everything else. And with that, we found some colleagues that are really looking at mental health issues. With 56% of all state prisoners having mental health problems, so much of this rests on how we have and how we develop supportive services for our population needs. 65%, 65% of all US inmates meet the medical criteria for substance abuse disorder. We have to understand our moral obligation to help these patients and their families overcome suffering. And we have to measure that with the folly of incarcerating nonviolent drug offenders. I have been fighting uh, this administration's proposal and what we saw the House recently approve in their health care bill uh, to strip addiction treatment coverage that our current laws provide. We cannot get to meaningful criminal justice reform if we don't have these basic health essentials protected under law. We have, uh, in a rather um, pointed conversation with Secretary Price when he came before the Appropriations Committee, it became clear that he envisions a system where a family faced with addiction, often, uh, I've heard from too many families here in Massachusetts who have lost their child or are struggling with it now, that it, the child is over 18. So it, very difficult to enforce treatment and other things on an adult who has privacy rights and other rights. And yet Se Secretary Price's idea is that somehow in the throes of addiction, you would be able to go out and purchase healthcare to cover that treatment. And you know, who knows what it would cost, never mind that that is just not the reality for families who are in crisis. We have found policymakers that understand that there is a link between sexual abuse of children, particularly girls, and incarceration. And we need to recognize and continue to look at early childhood trauma and the, and the role it plays. We have pushed and we have had some success in ending that school to prison pipeline. We passed a bill with our K-12 education reauthorization that prioritizes intervention and trauma-informed care over expulsion and harsh punitive measures that we're seeing over uh, in Massachusetts, I believe it was over 400 uh, pre-kindergarten students and kindergarten students were expelled or suspended in Massachusetts in one year. So we have had progress, but we've also been dealt a terrible blow. Uh, Jeff Sessions, I, I know it's no surprise to this crowd, announced new guidance that federal prosecutors should, quote, charge and pursue the most serious, readily provable offense, and that these offenses should carry the most substantial sentences, including mandatory minimums. And Jeff Sessions called this moral and just. It is anything but that. This is our moment where we have to look to the states I am delighted that we have the, the guidance of State Senator Will Brownsberger on the State Judiciary Committee leading those efforts. We need him. We need all of you. Um, this is a real threat to the work that you've done, the progress you've made. I know with the, the report out today, we can see that there is much more work to be done here that as we have a reducing population, we still have increasing costs of incarceration. And we need those resources for so many other things. But as this administration pursues a tried and failed 
uh, strategy for crime reminiscent of what we saw in the 80s and 90s. Individual states, you sitting in this room, are going to be the ones who are going to have to stop that. We, uh, we are lucky here to have you and those resources, but whether we're in a red state or blue state, um, this is not an issue that can be defined as conservative or progressive. This is an issue about morality, it is about economics, and it's about building a future for everyone. And I think it's imperative that all of us not only work with this community, and I, I see so many familiar faces here with the work you do to lift people up, but we have to make sure that we continue to engage the public and make them understand why this just isn't an issue if you have a family member or know somebody who's been incarcerated. This is an issue that affects you no matter what. Because we have to look at systemic racism in our country, we have to be honest about it, and we have to look at how we best spend resources that are going to be getting tighter and tighter under this administration flowing from the federal government to the states. We simply can't afford on so many different levels to not do this work. Closing prisons and reprioritizing rehabilitation programs is a win-win because it saves taxpayer dollars, it will breathe new life into mental health and drug treatment resources, and it's going to support a workforce that is ready and willing to contribute to our economy. I applaud the bipartisan leadership that we have here that's looking for those opportunities to lower correction costs, reduce our prison population, and reduce recidivism while keeping public safety a top priority. The work we do here is gonna be a model for the country. And unfortunately, the good news and the bad news <laughs> is that you're it. Uh, there is no other uh, buck to pass or place to go. It is gonna be your individual and collective efforts that change the course of not only the path that our country is on, but we're counting on all of you to be the ones who are gonna pull that arc of the moral universe back towards equality, justice, and opportunity. I am so proud to partner with you on this, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work you're doing. Thank you for having me.